when such events have taken place, that our hearts may be with them and that we indeed may work towards a time where such violence doesn't occur, where peace is the way of the world. Let us turn now to God in a time of prayer. Let us pray. As we continue to gather in these early days following Easter, following resurrection, O oh God, we gather trying to figure out what it all means. And we find it easy to relate to the women who fled the tomb with terror and amazement, and we understand Thomas and his need for proof that would come only by touching the wounds and seeing the nail marks. We understand the fear and confusion that kept the disciples in the shadow cast by closed doors. We also keep company with the travelers on the Emmaus Road who felt the strange burning of the truth and hope and love weaving into the sadness that consumed them on their walk. We try to figure out, caught as we are, and the eternal movement between fear and faith, doubt and conviction, wonder and worry. We trust you are present with us, O oh God. We trust. And that's why we've come here week after week, year after year, hoping to really find the faith to believe the story of Easter. Honestly, the only way that we can really grasp its truth is by accepting it, refusing to reduce it to scientific debate or historical literalism. That is how we understand the mystery of the death and life of Jesus and explain it. Is accepting it and living it, allowing it to permeate every grain of the sand that forms us, every thought, every priority, every act, and every interaction. And so as we are gathered now like then, you continue to come to us in unexpected places, in crowded rooms, in journeys on a dusty road, in conversation and in the stillness. You continue to show up to us in the midst of our doubt, our fear, our sorrow. You come in the power of the resurrection. You come to bring us peace, and we pray for the places where there is no peace. Countries torn by war, refugees seeking homes, prisoners facing torture. You come to bring peace, peace to the tensions and conflicts within us, to the regrets, the failures, the broken relationships, the lost friendships. You come to bring peace, for you are a friend to us when we are alone, when we are lonely, unseen. You are there. You come to bring us peace. And we pray that we may become peacemakers. So help us, we pray, to accept this truth, to live this truth, to be your witnesses of the peace which passes all understanding, that which we seek, that which we long for, that which we hope for, and that which we pray for as you taught us. Our God in heaven, holy is your name. Your reign come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. 
Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Let us pray for illumination. God of all the prophets, you fulfilled your promise of old that your Christ would suffer and so rise to glory. Through this hour span our minds to understand the scriptures and fill us with one joyful wonder in the presence of the living, risen Christ, that we may be his witnesses to the farthest reaches of the earth. We ask this through Jesus Christ, the firstborn from the dead, who lives and reigns with you and in the unity of the Holy Spirit. God, forever and ever. Amen. For scripture readings this morning, uh, start with a message from the book of Acts, a New Testament. It starts off, when Peter, when Peter saw it, he addressed the people. Well, we're thinking, what is it? Um, but if we go back a little on, in the Bible, it, he's talking about healing the lame man who was sitting in front of the gates of the temple. So, <clears throat> when Peter saw it, he addressed the people. Fellow Israelites, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we had made him walk? The God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the holy and righteous one and asked to have a murderer given to you. And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses, and by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. And now, brothers and sisters, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers, <clears throat> In this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets that his Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. The next reading is from the epistle, uh, the first chapter, or the third chapter in the first book of John. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. 
The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. From the Gospel of Luke. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened? And why did doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. Yet for all their joy, they were still disbelieving and wondering. And he said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. 
Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses to these things. This is the inspired word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. How we doing back there, Brad? We're good? Okay. Good to know. We take for granted things like in worship that sound comes through the speakers, that when Nick plays the keys on the pipe organ, sound comes through the pipes, and that when we seek to, to tune in online, that it'll be there. And when the, something happens that interrupts that, those of us who are playing the keys or uh, leading the technology or proclaiming the message find our stress level goes through the roof as we can't control certain aspects of things that might be unfolding. And so certainly uh, I am thankful to our tech team, to all those involved in worship at any time and their ability to be flexible uh, and the stress that comes alongside of being a leader in, in the church. Let's take a moment and pray. Lord God, may the meditations of my heart and mind and the words of my mouth be acceptable in your sight. May we hear your word afresh and may it inspire us anew. In Christ's name, amen. So here we are two weeks after Resurrection Sunday. And other than the fake grass of the Easter baskets that will continue to show up in our homes for the next year, and a few leftover jelly beans, things have moved on. Now last week when we gather, we picked up the story, at least here liturgically in the church, with Thomas, who always figures prominently in the season, who though he declared a need for physical confirmation, interestingly didn't end up requiring the actual touching to turn his faith. Perhaps he had a deeper sense of the truth that gave him eyes to see. And now we hear another week removed and another moment as we've gathered for worship where Jesus shows up. So we started with the Gospel of Mark on Resurrection Sunday. Last week we picked up a little more of the story from the Gospel of John and here we are over in the Gospel of Luke with a different moment. And with everything and all the facts laid before us and laid before them, interestingly, Luke talks about how doubt persisted. And maybe that's where we are at and why this scripture comes on this week, this many weeks after Easter. Because Easter holds all the promise of a different future, one that we declared in our own proclamations that morning of he has risen indeed and affirmed in our worship just a couple of weeks ago. And maybe we were then, we are transformed by it. But here we are two weeks later and we look around at the world and it doesn't look very changed. The world isn't looking very changed. The world is still a cruel place where evil and death seem to reign supreme and unchallenged most of the time. And so with that, perhaps it's easier to collapse Easter into celebrations of cyclical returns of seasonal shifts of dormant life awakened. We've gotten it down to stuff that we can haul out for a season and then put it all away. Because doubt persists. Now maybe that's because of our own desire for status quo, our innate demand to want what we have always wanted, to believe what we have always believed, and to know what we have always known. And so we talk about new life with Easter, but in truth we struggle and even resist to apply it, to live it. And maybe that's because we're not sure it's really possible. So we read this history. But we didn't come together to read history. I think we're gathering these couple of weeks beyond as our doubt still persists because we hope, we long, we need, 
we seek among our persistent doubts to have an encounter with the risen Christ, who we claim can heal our doubts and calm our fears and open our minds and fill us with life. And so we come here and we say, is it all just a dream, O oh Lord? And maybe that's part of the disciples saying the same thing, thinking they're seeing a ghost, a dream, longing for it to be true. But it's so far removed from reality, from what we know to be true. Why is it that we find it easier to explain it away that we're blinded to Jesus' presence among us. Where is it that we might finally discover that Jesus is walking right with us? When is it that we will find the resurrected Christ present among us? How is it that we will discover the peace that Christ offers to us? And what will it take to set our hearts afire in our hands to action with the message of forgiveness and new life? You see, my friends, faith is a turning point not a returning point. A turning point in the journey where hope and courage and love begin to grow. Faith is to sense with every fiber of our being what is possible to envision, to long, to believe in something so different than the reality that persists. And so we rub our eyes looking around at how things are so unchanged and wonder, and that's when Christ shows up among us, within us, reminding us of all that he said and did and said that we could, that we can, that we should do and say as we work out our salvation with fear and trembling, as we live and embody the truths of love of God and love of neighbor. That that's how resurrection is seen and heard and believed is through how it is done how it is lived by faith, working through changed hearts and transformed lives and across our politics and planet. Boy, does that seem so hard to imagine. Maybe it's hard to imagine because we know it's scary stuff to live that, to actually speak up and speak out about it being different, to listen and to work, to change our behavior, to advocate for others to do the same. That's the kind of stuff that gets people killed when you disrupt the status quo and say it doesn't have to be like this. It's what led the first followers of Jesus after seeing what happened to him to deny him and to scatter and, and to run away. And here we are two weeks later, maybe we're running too. But you can't run from the truth. It wouldn't let them go, it will not let us go. Jesus said, remember God loved the world so much that he gave his only son that the world might be saved. That we can mess this planet up and we can be awful to each other but our awesome God forgives and gifts us with possibility that just because it is this way does not mean it has to remain this way and so here we are running again packing away Easter and its decorations and reminders maybe hoping it will loosen its grip on us we can let go of the hopes. We can let go of our longings for peace. But Jesus keeps showing up. He keeps showing up with a message of love and forgiveness. He keeps showing up with that dangerous and disruptive message that exposes the accepted patterns of our world and our society, our fallacies concerning possibilities and impossibilities. And terrifyingly, he shows up and he calls us to share this message with the world, to share what we know is true about us, about our world. And that's why we show up. 
because we want it to be true, because somewhere deep down we know it to be true with every sense of our being, with every fiber of ourselves. And yet we show up with our persistent doubts after another week, looking upon the horrors of the world, feeling upset and rejected, dejected and sad. We sit here after another week asking, what went wrong and where was God? As the world looks so unchanged and sin abounds, we wonder what happened. We confess our dashed expectations. We confess the difficulty of loving our neighbor. We confess our hopes for a different outcome than what has been. And then we are reminded, as God's inspired word is shared and proclaimed, how God is victorious. God will be victorious through it all. We hear our link, our connection with all time, with all ages, and God's providential plan, how things had to be. We hear expounded the necessity of it all. God's grace through it all. New life abounding in it all. Fresh possibilities springing from it all. And suddenly in this time, as we've come back together, our desperation lifts even just a little bit. And the sun shines through and we feel something refreshed, renewed, restored, revived. Something has happened. Jesus has stepped among us and our faith is restored and our hope and our courage and our love return. We're charged and changed from what was toward what can be. Our faith shifts the ground beneath us, the very foundation beneath us. And we know nothing can ever be the same from this moment on. We can run from it. We can try to hide from it, to ignore it, but it will find us. It will find us. Jesus Christ is risen and his mission of liberating love is continuing in the face of the corruption, the power lust, the degradation and the oppression that is so rife in our world. We are to bear witness to the reality of this new life, to witness to God's passion for justice and love, to oppose everything that would destroy and degrade the beauty that God intended for the created world. We are to go and be the truth of the good news of God's all-inclusive love and freely offered forgiveness. We are to move into the world announcing and living, living out the message of life in the midst of death, hope in the midst of despair, and forgiveness and acceptance in the midst of judgmental rejection. And in a very real way in that, we are not just followers of the risen Christ, we are Christ to others. The story is true. And maybe it's factually true too. But the story is true because it happens again and again and again to us, to others. We gather behind our doors. We walk away from the challenges. And Christ appears. And enables us to see the message of the Bible in a new light. And it liberates us to live in new hope and joy. We come to our senses. And we say, yes, Christ. We see you. We hear you. We believe. We will do. We accept the freedom to be the people God knows us to be. To work for the world that will reflect heaven with the time that we have. To see the world with his eyes. To hear of the needs with his ears. To believe in what is possible. Unifying our hearts with his heart. And to do all that we can with all we can for as long as we can. And once we see him and see things from his perspective, there's no question that we will change. That the world will change. And that God's spirit will be with us always. Let us pray. Lord of dawn and darkness, how grateful we are for your loving mercies. 
you see our fear and our doubt, our suspicion, our mistrust, and you banish them from our lives, replacing them with hope, peace, love, and joy. You call us to be your witnesses to all the world, unafraid of what others might think or say about us. And so we have been invited out of our darkened hideaways into the light of your world as emissaries of hope and justice, peace and compassion. Be with us, we pray, as we participate in ministries of healing and hope through this church and in our community, region, nation, and world. Give us courage and strength to be your disciples in all the circumstances of our lives. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you join with me in affirming your faith this morning? We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil. Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. As we come now to respond to having heard God's inspired word and having that proclaimed, seeing Jesus in our midst and saying, yes, O Lord, we will follow. So we lift the commitments of our heads, our hearts, and our hands. This is also a second Sunday. It is the custom of this church that on every second Sunday we take up a special offering in addition to our general offering to go for something that is not supported in our general ministries. This month, the month of April, we are supporting the SPCA of Erie County. Did you know that the beginnings of such organizations trace back to the 1800s? The first one was started in England in 1824. And in 1866, the first one started in the United States. It was part of the humanitarian movement. The movement was launched by Christian thinkers with great moral concern for all life, for a wide range of animal and human causes. They understood the mission of these organizations to be one of many embodying religious ideals, and they, they have sought to prevent cruelty and to exercise kindness, a concern with suffering and well-being, and the justice needed. The mission of the SPCA serving Erie County started in 1867. It is the second oldest humane society in the country and is to create a more humane community through education, rescuing, protecting, and enhancing the lives of animals, and nurturing the bond between animals and people. Over 12,000 animals are assisted by the SPCA serving Erie County. The promise is to transform the lives of animals in Erie County and beyond, whether neglected, beaten, starved, abandoned, injured, or unwanted. The SPCA of Erie County is not affiliated in any way with any other animal agency or other human society or animal welfare group. It is completely independent and does not receive any city, county, state, or federal tax dollars with the programs and services of the SPCA serving Erie County, possible only through donations from caring people and organizations. There are four ways beyond what we are doing today in our offering that you can contribute to the SPCA serving Erie County. You can donate, you can adopt, you can volunteer, and something we can all do, you can speak up. Now, one of those four you can do this morning in our second Sunday, second helping offering. The plates will come around a second time for those who are physically present, and that second time will go to the SPCA. If you're joining us online, you can go to our website, ChristChurchAmherst.org, and you go to the Give tab on the right-hand side of the top of the page. And you can, through that portal, find your way to the second Sunday, second helping offering. And any of those, again, for this month, will go to the SPCA serving Erie County. So let us now receive our offerings this morning.
we are blinded by anger, O God, you pour out your love for all to see. When we wonder what tomorrow will bring, you call us to trust in you. When sadness fills our lives, you plant gladness in our hearts. God of Easter, touch us with your grace. You show us your hands so we may reach out to mend the broken. You show us your feet so we may walk with those the world passes by. You show us your face so we may know what our sisters and brothers look like. Risen Christ, touch us with your compassion. You open our eyes so we may see God's love. You open our minds so we may welcome God's word. You open our lips so we may be God's witnesses. You open our hands so we may share God's hope. Accept what we offer, what we have opened, and what we are open to, that they may share your grace with the world. In Christ we pray. Amen. May the light of God surround you. May the power of God uphold you. And may the love of God enfold you, now and always. Amen.